We have been preaching a dozen, a dozen, uh, maybe we'll make it a baker's dozen and do 13, but a dozen premium passages for Christian growth. Are you ready tonight? You want to learn something? You want to grow a little bit? A dozen passages, a dozen premium passages for Christian growth. I want to tell you this is exactly where this came from. This isn't some book somewhere. This is what the Lord has done in my life, Casey. This is what the Lord has done in my life. Twelve passages that meant the world to me as I began growing spiritually. And I want to pass these on to you. Some of them are very, you know, you've heard them before. And some of you haven't heard them before or even meditated on them before. Tonight we look at a golden passage for a Christian's lives. lives. Specifically, we're going to deal with one thought from the passage about influences in your life. Influences. What things, do you know that there are people and there are things that influence your life that really contribute to the person that you are here tonight? Really change the trajectory of your life. And what's sad is sometimes we don't realize those influences on our life and sometimes we do. The passage deals with a lot of things, but we're going to look specifically at the first couple of verses about influences that we allow to change our heart and mind over time in our Christian life that direct uh, and, and give the outcome of either whether we will be blessed and happy, that is rewarded and happy, or whether we will be directionless, directionless in life or purposeless in life. And ultimately, whether we'll be judged by the Lord in our life. And it, and it starts out, these th thoughts start out with the idea of who or what are you allowing to influence you. Some of you may have guessed it. Turn to Psalm chapter 1 tonight. Psalm chapter 1, an extremely um, familiar passage. Some of you memorized this maybe as a child. Psalm chapter 1. I won't ask you who has it memorized. I thought about giving a $20 bill out to anyone who could uh, quote it for me, but I thought that you guys would feel like that was too much like youth group or whatever. Turning Psalm chapter 1, Psalm chapter 1. I'm going to read it, and then we are going to just look at one piece of Psalm 1. Psalm chapter 1 says this, Blessed is the man, or woman, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and what? What's that thing? Day and night. Imagine that. Interesting. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His, life, or his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. That is, they will not stand up. They will not be able to maintain their present pride. They will be judged, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Heavenly Father, we come to you uh, on this midweek uh, evening to ask you that you would bless your holy word. We are asking you what you promised to already do. We know that the word is good. We know that these thoughts here have the, have the power, um, amazingly, to change someone who is listening tonight. All of us who are listening tonight. And so, Lord, we, with um, great anticipation and comfort and joy, look into this word. I ask that you would bless it. Help us have a good time. Let the folks participate, and even those at home be connected. And, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this good word. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. You see right away in verse number one a promise uh, to the godly person. And uh, what is the promise? If you're going to pick one word out of verse number one that is the promise to what we'll call the godly man in this chapter, what would that word be? You know, blessed, blessed, exactly. The first word, blessed. The word is interesting um, in a couple of ways. I'll tell you why by definition it's interesting. But I will tell you that it has a twin sister in the New Testament. Uh, it is one of those words that, uh, that the Old Testament word is very close to the New Testament word where we see Jesus saying over and over, oh, blessed, blessed, blessed is the person that does this, blessed is the person, Sermon on the Mount. 
This is a kind of a sister, uh, twin sister word in Hebrew that matches up to that Greek word. The word blessed here, though, it has a double idea. It is the idea of, yes, being favored, like God will bless you, like uh, it's kind of a conditional blessing. Bless, he'll, he'll favor you or reward you. I think reward is a better word. Uh, you know, blessed seems kind of vague sometimes, and favor gets kind of, kind of vague. However, it has another meaning, and it also has it even stronger in the New Testament word. And it's be, it is that you will be happy, that you will be, uh, your outlook in life will be joyful. Blessed is the man, both rewarded and happy, that does the following things in this chapter. Um, I'm sure that we all would like to be blessed. How, how, how many of you would like to be blessed in this way, that a godly man is blessed, both by reward and happiness? Yeah? Randall said, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. I'll take all the blessing I can get right now, especially. So how does that come in your life? Uh, is it a luck thing? Is it, uh, you know, some people, it's true that some people seem to have it easier in life and some people have better in life as, you know, kind of like a random thing. Is that uh, karma or some fortune cookie kind of thing? That, is that what it is? Well, there's a lot of discussion over about that kind of stuff. But this passage talks about conditions where the Lord will bless in your life and also uh, conditions where just doing these things will cause you to be joyful, will bring more happiness into your life. So let's, let's take a look at it. How does this blessedness come to the believer, to the Christian life? Well, number one, we must control the influences of our lives rather to be, than to be passive victims to the influences of your life. Have you ever met somebody who is a victimholic? That everything in life has happened to them. That they're not responsible for any of it. You know, it's not any of their fault, but it's because things happen to them. Well, there are some people who don't, who, who kind of take that posture concerning influences in their life. Like they're passive in it. Well, this is happening to me because I had a bad influence or I had negative people around me, whatever. Yoo-hoo, hello. We can control the influences of the people, especially in our lives. And uh, we're going to see in here, here in a second that people around us influence us in huge ways. Notice the categories of influences in verse number one. All right, it's done very poetically, but it really has deep meaning. We're not going to have time to work out all the meaning. But look at it, verse one again. Blessed is the man, or happy is the man, or, or, or rewarded, or, or favored is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, so think about the action there. What's, what's the verb? What's the action? Yell it out. Walketh, right. Walketh not in the counsel of God, God, nor standeth in the way of sinners. What's the action? Standeth, all right, in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And what's the action or non-action there? Sitteth, sitteth. The categories here of influence are walking, standing, sitting. And I, I want you to, before I, I hit what the target of those actions are, or where they're coming from or what they have to do with, I want you to, to think about the actions. So one is the, the first one is walking, the second one is standing, and then the next one is sitting. If you think about that as far as influences or what you're allowing to influence your life, there's kind of a progression there. So walking, you're, you're, you're hanging with someone who is influencing you, you know, kind of a, a certain way. And then you're standing, which kind of is kind of the, the picture of you're getting more information. It's not just like you're, you're bypassing that person, but now they're influencing you even more. And then sitting, you're actually hanging out. You're actually, you know, in a place, a dormant place where they are pouring into you. And we see who's pouring into you in verse number one. Who are these people? What are the words? What are the words of verse 1? Someone tell me. They are who? Who are pouring into you at verse 1? Yes, ungodly is one of the words. What else? Yeah, scorners. What, who's the first one? Sinners. Sinners, ungodly, and scorners. A scorner is someone who mocks, who mocks truth, who mocks good things, who mocks godly things, the things of the Lord. You know, complainers, negative complainers in your life 
are, would also fall underneath this definition of a, a scorner, someone who just is always negative about things of life. We could go into a lot more detail about the sinful characters and each of the sinful impacts they have on you, but for a short study tonight, and, and what we want to pull out of this is simply the idea of that there are people who are influencing me. And there are people who are influencing you in life. And they have a lot to do with a lot of things, like how you're going to turn out. But they also, the, the biggest thing here in verse number one that they have to do with is, is the word blessed. And that is God's reward on your life, uh, his favor on your life. I, I, I don't like to use that too broadly because that can get very, very charismatic. But, but then just simply your happiness, your joy of life, of who you allow around you. These people lead us in certain places, sinful people, ungodly people, which is a, a kind of a higher standard to, than sinners, and then scorners, mockers, complainers. Each of them have impact. They're influencers uh, on, their, on, our, on our lives in unbiblical and ungodly ways. And the promise of God is that you will be blessed by God and happy when you don't follow these sort of people, when you don't present yourself to be present in their path, two, two uses of present, when you're not present in their path, and when you're not sitting uh, in their presence or hanging with them, the ungodly and sinful people who are often mocking the truth, you know, even in humorous ways or even in subtle ways. Let me be honest, none of us in here are junior hires anymore. You know, uh, so your parents probably... Some of you who got in trouble blamed it on the bad influences of your life. You're not passive in this thing, okay? You're not trying to hang around with certain people to be popular anymore. You're making choices about the people uh, around you and what they're speaking into your heart. I want you to push the pause button, and I want to get you involved as a group a little bit. I want several of you to do this. So think about what we've said, verse 1. Push the pause button. I want to ask you this question, all right? You ready? You going to answer at home, too? Here we go. Who do you think, what person do you think has had the greatest or is having the greatest influence in your life right now, on your life? What person do you think is having the greatest influence right now on your life? I'm going to answer, and then I'm going to give you guys a chance to answer. We're all family. Okay, here. All right. So I would say, first of all, Amy, my wife, probably has the greatest single most influence in my life. Okay, right now, right now. I think after that, um, probably my close friends, you know, some, some that are pastor friends, some that are just friends I grew up with, they, they have a lot of influence on me. You know, they're, and that's funny when you're an adult, when you're a 50-year-old man to think that there are people influencing you, but they are. Um, someone else, people around here, Pastor Josh, you know, as corny as that guy is, he has an influence on me, all right? We spend a lot of time together. We, there's an influence there and other leaders in, in this church, or other friends in this church. And, and then I would say probably people I read, authors, articles, and things like that. Okay, so I've bore my soul to you. Someone else share a couple of people who you think have a great influence, or maybe the greatest influence on your life right now. I didn't know to you to be quiet, people. Somebody, yes, Stephanie. Okay, coworkers, coworkers. Who else? Who else has an influence in your life? Your siblings. Okay. All right. Somebody else. Who has an influence on your life right now? Greatest influence on your life. Anybody of you would say still parents? Still parents? Anybody? Who else? Someone else share. I'm not going to do all the work here tonight. Do, do, do. Who has the greatest influence? I want you to get you thinking. Who is influencing you the most? I'm going to start picking you. What do you think, Keith? Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, I didn't necessarily say influencing you in a good way, right? So who's having the biggest influence you? All right, so spouse, coworkers, any other, just real quick before we go on? Yeah. Yeah, people that you're corresponding with, people you meet up with in the course of, of a week. I think what is important for our passage here tonight is to understand that there are people influencing you. And it makes a huge difference in your life. It makes a huge difference about the attitude of your life. It makes a big difference about you know, the outcome of your life. It makes a big difference about the Lord and putting his hand upon your life. Or, or if you're listening to people who are against the Lord. You're not impervious to influence. Now notice verse number one as we look at it again. Obviously at face value, this is talking about bad influences. Very bad influences of your life. Um, people that are hurting you, um, mostly you would think about friends or your actual physical face-to-face -face people. In these days of scripture, face-to-face -face people would have had probably the biggest influence on us, and the Bible talks that way in the culture of the day. Um, but I uh, started thinking about this in our generation. In our generation, uh, do you think that it is face-to-face -face people that have the biggest influences on us? Or maybe actually um, interaction or influences that are coming from other places? Because there are things in our generation that the psalmist could not, would not write about because he would not have been exposed to our generation. What are some other influences that we have other than face-to-face -face people in our life? Real quick, popcorn here. Social media, what else? The media in general, okay, TV, news, movies, podcasts. Anybody else add anything to that? Radio, okay, yeah, very good. Eight track, you know, beta, you know, we go clear back right after. Yes, Victrolas, yes, exactly right. Okay, I thought Victrolas was the funniest one, and I didn't get any laughs on that. Uh, there are other influences that, are, that are, would be included in the understanding of this blessed passage of what we're allowing in our lives um, that affect our happiness, affect the Lord's blessing on our life because we're submitting. We are not passive in this. You're not passive in what you're allowing to influence you. You're not a victim. There's nobody in here that's a victim to your influences, and we need to stop thinking this way. So I started doing digging. I started going on a little bit of a rabbit trail, and I want to give you some statistics, okay, concerning other influences in your life. Um, the average American right now, 2020, spends two hours and four minutes per day on social media. That is not technology, that is purely social media. That would be Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, okay? So uh, by age 72, uh, the average person living in 2020, the average, I don't know where that starts, or depends how old you are, yeah? But the average person will, spe will have spent six years and eight months on social media by age 72. Six years and eight months of their life on social media. Wow, wouldn't you like to get that back, okay? So by comparison with, of that statistic to friendships, to face-to-face, -face, real organic friendships in our life in 2020, by age 72, you know, so social media is... Uh, six years, eight months, by age 72, how much time will the average person alive in 2020 have spent on face-to-face -face friendships in comparison? So if social media is six years and eight months, how much is friendship? Two years, less than a year, any other guesses? One year, 11 months. So if you'd hear that statistic by itself, you're going to spend one year and 11 months on friendships. You say, oh, that's pretty good. And you wouldn't think about it. In comparison to something as simple as 
looking at Facebook or looking at other social media. By time, folks, by time, when you consider verse number one and other influences in your life, by time, just considering the, the, your time of your life, the average person, social media, news, news, podcasts, media could be influencing you much more than friendships. Most people look at verse number one and they think about people. I'd like you tonight just for a moment to realize it's broader than people. That it is what you're allowing to influence you. And those things are coming from real people that could be sinners and ungodly and scornful influencing you. The blessed man controls his life influences. So I want you to think about it right now. What are you allowing to influence you? Think of the time that you spend. You know, what is it that is you're allowing to pour into the sponge of your heart and your brain uh, concerning social media or TV or Netflix, whatever? Are, you're soaking up all these philosophies and attitudes that are coming through that. And you say, you may say that you're strong enough that you're not, but you are. Okay, so, so what's interesting about verse number one, here's another thing, is that it, it doesn't say what the person is soaking in. It's saying that he is walking, standing, and sitting. Maybe the word counsel, you, could, you can understand that he's receiving some. I think, I'm thinking most of us understand how much influence that bad person or that bad media is on us, really our heart. Do you know that this is this by far, this, this, I don't even have to quote statistics, by far this generation of young people are the most depressed and the most suicidal that we've ever had. And why is it? Because they are the, the, the generation. One of the big factors that psychologists would quote is that they're growing up just on media. They're, they're growing up, and it, it, it has an effect. It has a negative, blessed effect. Interesting. Second point, and the last tonight, we must delight and meditate on God thoughts. We must, there's a comparison here in verse number two. We must meditate, rather, we must meditate and delight on God thoughts. Look at verse number two. It says, but his delight, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, God's law, doth he meditate day and night. Now this is a comparison verse to the man that is being so influenced by the things of verse number one. Understand the contrast between the bad influences of verse number one entering in your mind and the meditation of verse number two on influences, let's call them God thoughts. Now the word in verse number two for God thoughts is what? Yell it out. It's in the Bible. It's not in my head. Sure. Law, right. God's law. Um, I Guess where I'm reading right now in the Bible? Leviticus. Leviticus. Yeah, it's a, a guy... A guy called me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading, the book of, reading in the book of Leviticus. And he says, what in the world are you reading Leviticus for? Leviticus is just this stuff that is just so heavy and head scratching and all these things that the Lord requires of priests and of sacrifices and of holy days and of Sabbaths and all of this stuff that declare his holiness and the impossibility of approaching God and, and the need for a savior and all that. There, I just preached the book of Leviticus. However, verse 2, when it's talking about his law, it's talking about the psalmist that in other places says, Oh, how beautiful is thy law. Oh, how I love thy law. And he was saying that about the book of Leviticus, which he didn't have the grand scope of, he didn't have the full picture of Jesus in Leviticus that we have with the whole canon of Scripture. We understand the whole story. We know that those, those sacrifices and everything were only leading to Jesus, the perfect sacrifice that we sang so many songs about. If he could say, oh, how I love thy law, if he could say in verse number two that delights in the law of the Lord. Reading Leviticus and saying the word delight is a really strange thing to do. If he is that way, how much more should we delight in God thoughts? When we know the whole story, we know the whole thing. We know more than anyone has ever known. All of the, the whole volume of scripture. 
delighting here in verse 2 in God's word has to be a decision change in your life. <coughs> a, a discipline, can we say it that way? A practice? Let me make it easier, easier for you. How about a quest for the first word of this chapter? How about a quest for being blessed? A quest for happiness? A quest for God's favor? You know, of course God's favor fully comes in Christ, but our, the way that we allow our lives to be influenced changes our outlook and our attitudes. Delighting is a discipline, a practice. Choosing the most beautiful thing to influence you rather than the influences we've discussed that apply are the applications of verse number one. I'm going to tell you, frankly, it is more natural in our life are to, to uh, allow our lesser man to rule. You know, by lesser man, I mean our fallen man, our, you know, our broken man, the one that the Lord saved us from, the sin nature that is still pooling on us, okay? Our old man. It's, it's very, it's, it's so much easier sometimes to allow your lesser man to rule, to desire secular, even sinful things. I want to have a, confe- I want a confession party to you right now concerning verse number one and verse number two. It is much easier for Toby to want to feel, fill his extra time with easy things like movie or social, me- uh, social media or things like that, TV shows, whatever. It's easy. It's, you just turn off your brain. It's whatever. But it is much more often uh, that my mind can be filled with verse number one than verse number two that way. It's much harder to have a quest for the blessed by filling my mind with God thoughts. Now, practically, when we read verse number two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Immediately you think of verse number two as what? What's the picture that you get in your head of someone doing verse number two? They're reading their Bible, they're thinking about it, meditating. That is first definite application of verse number one. Or excuse me, verse number two. I want to push that a little bit farther, though, in saying that, Yes, you can fill your, you should firsthand fill your eyes and your heart and your mind with reading and meditating on this word. But kind of when you think about verse number one and about how people influence you, you so much, another application of verse number two is to fill yourself around with people who are also meditating on the word. And things like what my dear brother does fills his day with music that is God honoring, that, that another way just to get God's stuff, God's thoughts, God's meditations into your mind. Choosing to spend at least some of your time, not just in turn off mode. I know what that's like, it's tired, you're tired, you just want to turn your brain off and you just want to sit and just watch something or whatever. At least some of it, uh, of your time pushing forward to spend time in God-honoring things or in things that are the delight of, of his law. The word delight here is a noun. It's not a verb, okay? It, it is someone, but he delights. His delight is in the law of the Lord. This is something that I think is a little bit like green beans. All right, let's go into our next point. When I was growing up, I did not have a choice about whether to eat vegetables or not, Okay? In our home, we put the number of vegetables that was our age on our plate. So if I was, when I was nine, I had to eat nine green beans. I assumed that there was a starting place. It didn't just start with like one green bean. But, you know, what's interesting about not all the vegetables, but what's interesting that over time, as I grew older, I could tolerate some, and some I even liked. I hated vegetables when I was younger. I hate most vegetables now. But there are some that you kindle, what's it called when you you grow in a taste for something? There's a word for that. There's a phrase. What is it? Acquired. Yeah. An acquired taste for it. Yeah. You acquire a taste for it after a while. I think that's how it was with coffee for me, and now I just can't get enough of it. Okay. I think... The, the word delight in verse number two, you know, it's, it is a noun just talking about his delight is in the law of the Lord. I think this is, there is an acquiring to seeing the beautiful ways of the Lord in the Bible that is only going to come by you disciplining yourself to look at it. 
and to meditate on it and to see the glory of it. And that doesn't come with um, some you know, book from, the, from Amazon, you know, how to read the Bible for 30 seconds and become a godly man. Okay, this is a meditation, is this churning and looking at the word. Um, so the, con- the contrast in verse number two of not filling your life with the influences of, of verse number one is that you're filling your life with, yes, the straight word of God and meditating in it for yourself, but then surrounding your life, developing friendships with godly people that speak God's ways to you, listening to music, reading good books, these things that fill our heart. You know, it is the outcome of a happy believer. It is the outcome of a man that is blessed by the Lord, a woman that is blessed by the Lord because of how she is filling her life. We're not going to go through the rest of the verses, but the rest of the verses in this passage just basically speaks that the blessed man, he'll flourish. She'll flourish. She'll be fruitful like a healthy tree. The man who follows unbiblical influences and succumbs to them, he will, his life will be without purpose. One of the beautiful, most, most straightforward pictures, I think, in all the Bible, you know, chaff that the wind drives away, you know, this really light tra- chaff that the wind comes and, and the pieces go everywhere. That's the life of someone who is filling himself with influences of secular influences, worldly, sinful, ungodly, even scornful influences. Tonight, I just want to challenge you from this golden passage about the influences of real life. And I I hope I stir some of you that you will, for the glory, for for the blessedness, that you will push ahead and fill your life with influences that are like God's law, that are around God's law and his wonderful thoughts. So let's have a word of prayer. Father,